a video that brought me a very important realization. Let's compare a cheap dose rate meter with a professional one used in our laboratory. Gamma calibration sample with cobalt 60, cesium 137 and radium 226 are prepared. It's important to note that the professional device can measure both activity and dose rate, with the latter being measured at the front of the device. To start, let's use the cobalt 60 sample. To make a somewhat fair comparison, shielded gamma samples are used since the hobby device cannot measure alphas. This means that we can only measure the dose rate coming from beta and gamma radiation. The peak value here is 24.6 microsieverts an hour on contact. Season 137 shows a significantly higher dose rate. To make this test as fair as possible, the samples are always held as close to the device as possible. I would assume that everyone would measure things like this, even though it doesn't correspond to the actual dose rate that your body would receive. But we will get to the theory behind that later. For season 137 we reach a peak value of 80.8 microsieverts an hour. Last but not least, radium 226. While it's primarily an alpha emitter, it also has gamma lines with a probability of around 3%. This sample is embedded in resin, so the alphas do not escape. We reach a maximum value of 184 microsieverts an hour. And now for the video, I have to turn on the sound, I guess. And now let's turn it off again, otherwise I will go crazy hearing that annoying sound always. Now let's use the hobby device, which costs around 80 euros. This measures the dose rate directly beneath the device. And we can get a maximum dose rate of 4.35 microsieverts an hour. For season 137, it definitely detects a significantly higher dose rate, showing a maximum value of 15.12 microsieverts an hour. For radium 226, it measures a whopping 94.56 microsieverts an hour. And since I've already have so many radioactive samples here, I have to max out the hobby meter. So 99.99 microsieverts an hour is the limit for this device. If I calculate the average of the values, I can conclude that the hobbyist measurement device measures about one third compared to the professional one. This is quite important. The actual dose rate could be three to eight times higher than what it shows on the cheap device. Well, wait, summarizing it at one third is a bit too rough. Specifically, we have relative efficiencies of 18%, 19% and 51%. I can provide you the gamma energies, but you can also find them on the Isotope browser app that you can download for your phone. Radium 226 has a 186 kilo electron volt line. Cesium 137 has a 661 kilo electron volt line. And Cobalt 60 has one at 1173 and one at 1332 kilo electron volts. One possible explanation for such a difference in the efficiencies is the detector size. It's not only just about the radiation and the source's activity, but the energy must be deposited inside the detector to be measured. In a larger detector, there can be more energy deposited at any time. But why do we need to know values like the dose rate? There are different dose quantities, and when you include the time component, you get a dose rate. Starting from the most physical standpoint, we have the activity, meaning how many decays per second, regardless of the type of decay. Based on this, we have the energy dose. It's measured in gray and no longer describes what's emitted by the source, but rather the energy deposited inside the material. As different materials have different properties, we should also specify what materials this is. This leads to terms like air energy dose or water energy dose. The organ equivalent dose is the first unit that takes into account the biological effects of ionizing radiation. The unit is sievert, which is calculated as shown like here, with D being the organ energy dose and W being a literature value that can be found in a table like this. Now we know how much one organ receives, but humans are more than one organ. Now to calculate for the effective dose a weighing factor for the individual organs is included with the organ equivalent dose. Some organs are more sensitive to ionizing radiation than others. The size of the organ was, in practice, included in the organ equivalent dose within the organ energy dose. It's calculated as follows. The problem here is that I don't know the correction factors that were applied during the calibration process to account for the fact that there are energy ranges that fit so perfectly that they pass 
right through a one centimeter thick counter tube and only partially deposit their energy in it. And in the human body, they can then deposit their entire energy because the body is of course a bit thicker than one centimeter. Another issue with dose rate meter in general is that they cannot know how close they are being held to a sample and which radionuclei currently emits this radiation. Another thing that the devices cannot know is in what form are the radioactive sources? Is it radioactive dust that can be inhaled? If so, how big are the particles? Is it in a form that can be ingested? Or is it just external radiation? A dose rate meter tries to summarize all these factors with a correction factor and yes, it must be calibrated to some radionuclei and all the nucleides are then just accordingly just approximation. But I don't know which radionuclei they are calibrated for. As a conclusion, the dose rate always has to be a conservative estimate. What's displayed on the device is the maximum dose a body could receive. Now we can understand the thoughts behind an effective dose and the ineffective dose of 10 sievert is lethal. Such devices are helpful indicators for estimating the risk of radiation exposure, but calibrations is usually very complicated and transferring all the factors behind this effective dose from the measurement that the detector took is very complicated. However, the measurements on the device should always indicate the maximum radiation exposure. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my patrons John, Ben and Nico. With that being said, goodbye.